welcome. Great to see everyone. I'm Matt Olin, and uh, we have an unbelievable, uh, fantastic morning planned. It's going to be great, and uh, you know, when, when the Creative Mornings team and I got together to talk about planning the event for Okay, okay, month. hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What the hell is going on here, Mike? What is going on? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Matt, what is, what is going on here? The jig is up, Mike. What is happening? All right, all right. So, you know, I just flew in from New Jersey last night, and, uh, you know, I've been wanting to get to Creative Mornings for a long time. And, yeah, I just wanted to see what it's like. Yeah, what it's like to come to Creative Mornings as you, Mike Olin, experience it, enjoy it, not show up and, 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 and pretend like you're me. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. You don't see me coming up to Princeton, walking around campus, telling your students what to do. All right, well, that's true, Matt. But, you know, I could have come out here and said, Hi, I'm Matt Olin, and in the interest of transparency, this month's theme, I want to finally admit to everyone here that as an 11-year-old, I was not shoved one night by a Yeti in Florida, like I've claimed for so many years. So I was shoved off of a wall in Florida when I was 11 years old. I was, it was late one night, he came out of the woods, he pushed me off the wall, and then I watched him run across the street in two steps. It happened very quickly, and I, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Sorry. And exactly what was a Yeti doing in Orlando? Vacation. My job here is done. Uh, I'm just going to go over here and continue my existence as not being the host of Creative Mornings. Ladies and gentlemen, my identical twin brother, Mike Olin. We've all heard the adage that laws are like sausages. You, you don't want to see them being made. And so we thought, well, let's get a lawmaker and a sausage maker up here, and let's really dig deep and find out, you know, how true this is. So I'm so thrilled that they decided to get up here and do this ridiculousness with us. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We're very excited about that. Right now, uh, we have our uh, uh, Charlotte Staple. I mean, he's been around forever. We used to share stages back in the day, right? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jason Scavone to the stage, everyone. Sometimes these words get twisted up and leave you right there. If we don't ever stay away But there's no comfort left in places we were hiding So we left to face the pain But I brought it all our way Every time you shine same words that I'll wait for you to figure out whether you could set your doubts aside if you could see that I'm not where I used to be won't you find today with me Scavone, everybody, let's give them one more round of applause, please. Thank you. Awesome. We are, of course, exploring the theme of transparency this morning. But before we do, do we know what time it is? I think we do. Yeah, let's see. Yes! Okay, so in the spirit of uh, our topic this morning, we're going to play a game called Law or Not a Law, specifically North Carolina Law or North Carolina Not a Law. So the ones that are not laws might actually be laws in other states. They are. But they're not just the laws in North Carolina. Basically, when, when we put up a law on the screen, and you have to decide if it's law or not a law, you're going you're gonna to actually turn to your side of the room, and you need to go with the will of the people. Okay? The will of the people. So that's how that's going to work. Same here, Brandon, right? Will of the people. And we'll just kind of go back and forth, I guess. Okay, it's law. <laughs> Guys, I'm seeing, okay, I'm going to go with 
No, it's not a law. First, let's talk about our esteemed state, Senator Jeff Jackson. Senator Jeff Jackson's career in public service began as a private in the Army Reserve. He served in Afghanistan for a year-long deployment. After he came home, he attended law school at UNC Chapel Hill with help from the GI Bill. Prior to joining the General Assembly, Jeff worked as an assistant district attorney and tried over 100 cases. He is now the youngest Democratic state senator in North Carolina. Please welcome to the debate stage, Senator Jeff Jackson. Right? Also, Cassie Parsons was trained as a chef in a privately owned fine dining restaurants, hotels, and health spas in North Carolina and Virginia, where she cooked for more than a decade. She is known for her incredible work at Harvest Moon Grill, first with her food cart, which featured 100% local food, and then at her restaurant in Uptown Charlotte, where she was executive chef. She has now brought her concept home, where she resides, opening Harvest Moon Grill on Main Street in downtown Lincolnton, that city's first and only farm-to-table restaurant. Please welcome to the debate stage, Cassie Parsons, everyone. Check, check. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I'm your moderator, Lester Holt. <laughs> and... Um, I'm super excited about this. So here's how we're going to do this, ladies and gentlemen. We are, each, each of our uh, candidates are going to have a one-minute opening statement where they get to center on the theme of transparency. Then we will move into the main questions phase where both Senator ja Jackson and Cass will have two minutes each to deliver their answer. We will then have a lightning round where they will only have two, they, they can only answer in three words or less. <laughs> so to your typical debate, obviously. <laughs> And then a closing statement. So we are, and hopefully time for Q&A after that. So we are off to the races. Ladies and gentlemen, let us start here. The coin flip went to Cassie Parsons. So let's start with Ms. Parsons. Your opening statement, please. Well, I'll be transparent. I'm a little nervous. So <laughs> thanks for having me today. Pleasure meeting you. I hope we do well together. <laughs> <clears throat> Given the way the debates have been going lately, I think this will be fun. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Anybody that knows me, I'm about talking about real food. And real food um, can drive in many different directions. A lot of times I end up pissing people off when they come into my restaurant. Seriously, that's transparent. Because I tell you the truth. Um, food is important today. There are so many things that are affecting our, our uh, food system. It affects our wealth and health of our community. And if you think for one moment, every time you buy food, wherever you buy it, it's not affecting the community, it's not affecting the world, then you may want to pause and listen up today. Because it's very important when it comes to food, I am super passionate about it. I'm as real as I possibly can be. Um, I love my craft. So here I am today to show you how to make sausage, talk about sausage, what the fillers are and just um, try to create conversation. Awesome, thank you very much, Cassie Parsons. <laughs> Senator Jackson, your opening statement, please. Oh Good morning, Hofstra. <laughs> <laughs> I know the best words. I have all the best words. <laughs> I'm smarter than the generals. This is gonna be easy. You went to I'm clearly in the more transparent profession. <laughs> nice try, Cassie. So here's how transparency works in your General Assembly. I'm going to give you an example with the budget. Here's how it happens. I'll come into my office one morning at 8 a.m., and the budget will just be on my desk. It'll be about 60, 70 pages. It'll spend $21 billion, that being all of your state income tax. And then it will be called for a vote later that afternoon. And no one will get a chance to read it. 
It will be written by a small handful of people. Maybe three or four will actually have had a chance to see the whole thing. I'm in the minority party, but even members of the majority party, most of them won't actually get a chance to read the budget, let alone members of the press having a chance to take a look at it, let alone any of you having a chance to read it or have substantive input. And you know what? My party did the exact same thing when we were in charge. When we were in charge, we didn't even give them the budget that morning. It was on their desk in the Senate, and we called for a vote immediately, and you couldn't touch the staples on the budget because they were still hot from the printing press, <laughs> and they would burn you. That's how transparent we are. Ouch. Thank you very much, Senator Jackson. <laughs> Two very compelling opening statements, and now we're going to move into the main questions of our uh, debate here. The first is a two-part question. When people say you don't want to see the sausage get made, they're usually using it as a metaphor that means you do not want to see the inner workings of such and such enterprise. Tell us why people should not want to see the sausage get made in both of your fields, and then tell us why we might actually need to be aware of what goes on behind the scenes. And we'll start with Je uh, Senator Jackson. I'm supposed to call rich strangers every night for two hours and ask them for money. Do you have any idea how frickin' painful that is? <laughs> Anybody wanna see that? Uh -huh. It's gross, but you all need to see it. If everybody actually watched politicians raise money, we would do what we should have done decades ago, which was publicly finance all of our campaigns, <laughs> get all this rotten money out of politics. It's something that is both inevitable and taking forever to happen. Let's talk about how we draw our districts in North Carolina, something called gerrymandering. We let whichever party happens to be in charge during the census, which we do every 10 years, that party gets to draw all the districts. I assure you, if you can draw all the districts, you control the outcome. In North Carolina, you have 50 state senators. You have 120 members of the House for a total of 170 legislators. 90% of us cannot lose a general election. We are invulnerable. It doesn't matter if we endorse our opponents. <laughs> Give them all our money. 90% of us cannot lose, and that's because of the way we let the, the districts be drawn. They're drawn by the politicians themselves. Lots of states have figured out how to solve this with independent redistricting. It's something we desperately need to do. And again, this is something that my party did for decades. All the guys who are in charge right now, they all filed bills to end gerrymandering when they were in the minority, and my side threw all those bills in the trash can because we never thought we'd be out of power. And then 2010 came along, the backlash to Obamacare kicked in, and they swept into power during the year when they got to redraw the districts. And now North Carolina makes international headlines on a regular basis. And that's why. It's because of gerrymandering, and it has to stop. Let's shift over to Cassie Parsons. I'm going to take the, the chicken route, okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about making chicken sausage. Did you know 3% of the chicken that's out on the market is, by, is produced by independent producers? That's the organic and the small sustainable farmers. 97% of the chicken farmers out there are big ag. It's a 30 over, actually a 30 over a $30 billion industry. And I don't know about you, but um, I kind of lean into the 3%. That's who I play with. That's the kind of fillers I want in my sausage. So I kind of brought some sausage to take a look at. This is a package of, well, it's pork sausage, but chicken sausage. You know, if you really want to know what's going into it, well, I just told you, $30 billion. It's called greed. It's called, you know, not taking care of our airways, our waterways, um, lagoons, um, you know, labor, um, slave labor. Do you, do you guys even get what goes into this sausage? There are so much more than just one ingredient or two ingredients that go into your body making that sausage. It's about water, it's about air, pollution, it's about our soil, it's about our laws that we just keep sort of sweeping under the rug and not wanna address. So today I get to be transparent about you. If you think for one moment 
Every time you buy something from the big box and you're not responsible when you don't read the label, you should start reading the label. You should start asking questions. You know, when I'm, I'm talking about uh, cooking and talking about making uh, products that come from my restaurant, I'm talking about love. I'm talking about connection. I'm talking about my community. I learn what, what's happening within the industry. I'm an expert at it because I really want to know what's going in my my body. So if I know what's going in my body, I can take care of your body. That's called transparency. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much to Typical. both of you. And unlike Lester Holt. Mm -hmm. Lester, I have to. This is yes, a big please. sausage <laughs> with their lobbying money. We're sick of it. I'm here to hold them accountable. Thank Go ahead. I was going to say, unlike, unlike, unlike Lester Holt, please clap all you want. Uh, this is... I'm just getting warmed up. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Let's move on to question two, shall we? Tell us about an early batch of your product that made you question why you got into this. How did it change what you do? And let's start with Cassie Parsons. Jesus, I don't know if we have enough time, but here we go. When I, when I first started in the industry, I sort of worked my way through, uh, excited to learn more about, you know, cooking, what goes in it, et cetera. But the moment happened to me, two things happened to me. I um, got really discouraged with the industry, so I got out and I started farming. Once I started farming, I started working with other farmers that were doing great practices. And Jane Biggers was from Salisbury, and she was a little squirty little 70-year-old uh, uh, woman. And she looked at me and she said, you know, Cassie, it's criminal that you're a chef and you don't even know where your food is coming from. And it made me pause. And it's made me pause every day of my career since then, and it's been 13 years. But prior to that, I was feeding you, I was feeding you a bunch of crock, a bunch of duping. Because, see, I was trusting the big boxes that were coming through the back door. I was trusting those strawberries that were staying plump and beautiful and um, red, that they were good, that they tasted good, that their essence was good. I was trusting that all the meats were coming through my back door were clean. I had no clue until I actually started learning about where my food came from. And when I was working with that farmer, Jane Biggers, when she asked me that question, it hit me upside the head and it was like, oh my God, I have to do something about it. Because this whole time, I'm a chef, I, I'm supposed to have honor, I'm supposed to be feeding you good food, and this whole time I knew nothing about my career or my love or my craft. And I think it's important that as I keep maneuvering through my, my craft, that I learn more about it, that I express it to you, I teach it to you. Um, it's a very passionate, uh, very, um, it's a scary thing that we're in today, that we can look around and that there's 1,800 restaurants in the Charlotte region and they're not buying local food from small sustainable farmers that are doing their food right. <clears throat> Senator Jackson. When I was first running, I did a lot of door knocking. And that's your product when you're running. You're out there putting yourself forward and allowing people face to face to judge you. And I had a lot of experiences knocking on people's front doors that made me seriously question whether this was a wise pursuit. I had a woman open the door and I said, hi, I'm Jeff, I'm your state senator. And she said, good for you, and just closed the door. <laughs> I had a woman open the door and take one look at me in this outfit, and she said, I'm sorry, we're Presbyterian, <laughs> and closed the door. Oh and you would be genuinely amazed at how many men open the door in their underwear. <laughs> they just feel comfortable doing that. The doorbell rings, they're not wearing pants, and they're like, no problem. I'm just going to go expose myself to whoever happens to be there. And so it, it's happened so many times that I've actually got a system for it. When they open the door and I detect no pants, a no pants situation, <laughs> we talk right here. I make great eye contact and the whole conversation, I'm just intensely focused on what they are saying to me. And that's an instance of too much transparency in politics that I think 
we need to address. Okay, that is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Question three. Once you achieve success, there's always pressure to sacrifice quality and cheapen the product with inferior components and filler. What do you do to prevent this from happening? And we'll start with Senator Jackson. Um, so in my profession, the consultants that exist, here's what they want me to do right now and every day, every time I'm in front of a camera. They want me to use these stock phrases that they have discerned from polling data that will be helpful for whatever electoral season we happen to be in. Our consultants do not want me talking about gerrymandering because they say nobody cares. <laughs> nobody knows and nobody cares. They don't want me talking about money in politics because our side has to raise a whole bunch of money and it makes us look like hypocrites. They don't want me talking about issues that I talk a lot about like early childhood education because within the realm of education, they want to talk about the issues that poll highest every single year, even if some of us are more focused on creating lasting generational change. And the way you get around that is by having something my grandfather gave me, which is just a healthy dose of irreverence. <laughs> a healthy dose of, that's cool, I hear you, not going to happen, but I hear you. And in in having gotten to office in a kind of unusual way, I was appointed after our mayor here was arrested by the FBI. <laughs> and then our state senator, Dan Clodfelter, was appointed to be mayor. And then I was appointed to fill in for Senator Dan Clodfelter. I had this beautiful window of like three or four months where I could pretty much say whatever the hell I wanted to say. <laughs> to say exactly what I actually thought. And I've just gotten addicted to it now. And it's too late to go back. Cassie Parsons. I have to say amen to that. <laughs> you would. <laughs> well, I'm still trying to treat, uh, achieve success. Um, you know, success is um, in an interpretation. Um, I think I'm pretty successful because I'm actually doing what I really love doing. So that's, that makes it a good thing. Um, in my industry, you know, across the board, um, a lot of chefs don't want to hear what I have to say. And um, <clears throat> because of that, I tend to solo, but I've always been a kind of a solo individual anyway. I kind of ride out there and do my thing, and I kind of shake it however I like to. Um, and that's okay. I encourage people to do that. I encourage that next generation to kind of take it on and go for it and don't care what anybody thinks. But do it because it's right. Do it because you got conviction. And that's what I'm learning about my success in my industry is that, and it was another pivotal moment, somebody said to me, Jane Biggers, this farmer, she said, you don't have any conviction. And I'm thinking for the last 13 years as I've been kind of massaging this whole local food movement, all of the rhetoric about, I'm gonna save the farmers, I'm gonna save the food system. Well, guess what? You still haven't, we haven't. So that's not very successful, but I do think that we're on the road to success because it's continuing to be a conversation. You know what I think I like the most about this room today is that I see so many new faces that we can connect. Come to my restaurant, come and support farmers, chefs that are working with real food, that are mindful about the ground, the soil, the air, the laws. I want to hang with the individuals that are educated. I would say state, but I don't like state. I like Carolina. So. Um, but stay with people that are really knowledgeable about their craft and really want to push the message. And that's what I'm doing. In Lincolnton, just to kind of give you an idea about Lincolnton and the people I get to play with. It's a small town. There's 72 fast food restaurants. I'm the only one. We are, aren't we, Chef? The only sh uh, restaurant in the community that actually is doing real food from real farmers. I pride myself on that because I source it within this area. <laughs> Senator Jackson. 
Oh. Didn't I already answer this question? Yes. This is an example of the mainstream media. <laughs> <laughs> Intrinsic bias. This microphone sucks. You need to keep it's going. my microphone. It's my Kenya. <laughs> okay. Yes. Wow. Got to keep me on my toes over here. I'm buckling under the pressure. All right. Question four. Do words like organic and authentic really have any meaning anymore? And let's start with Cassie Parsons. No. <laughs> organic example. 90% of the garlic, I don't know if you know this, but you should know this. Now you get to know it because I'm being transparent about it. And you can look it up. And it's true. True transparency. 90% of the garlic that comes in the United States is from China, especially the organic garlic. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want garlic from China. It's not very transparent. If you haven't like been reading or experiencing what's happening in another country, you probably should. But a lot of our food is being infiltrated into the United States from other countries. Smithfield was just bought by a China company and all those pigs are going to go to China and get processed and then they're going to come back and you're going to feed you. Doesn't that seem kind of weird? So organic doesn't really mean anything, but it is a question. So when I'm buying food, I find out where it's coming from and local is, hyper, hyper local is more important. I want to make sure that my farmers aren't putting synthetics on the um, ground. What is synthetics? It's fertilizers that are manipulated by man. Synthetics. It's oil petroleum, those kind of things. So I ask certain questions to the farmers that I'm buying food from, and if they can answer the question properly, then I'll move on and I'll buy their product. I don't buy food just because it's organic, because organic means nothing to me. It probably should mean nothing to you. Authentic, what's authentic? I don't know. Anything can be authentic. You know, a flour can be authentic, pork can be authentic, but it's a great way to divert us to start. If we see organic and authentic and all natural, it diverts each one of us to not really look at the real issue. Do you get where I'm going with this? So I say, you know, don't care about what this marketing machine is doing. Start talking to your neighbor. Start talking to the folks at the farmer's market that are your neighbor. Get to know who your farmers are and know what color of eyes they have. Know what they're putting on their ground. Go to their, I mean, why not? Why not go to their farms? Awesome. Thank you. Senator Jackson. In one of her answers, Cassie talked about the next generation and how important she thinks that next generation is. And I'm in love with the idea, frankly, of the next generation because I think one of the key attributes for that generation, we're talking about millennials, is they are looking for authenticity in politics. The phrase authentic politician has become its own punchline. People my age, with a few exceptions aside, have never seen anything but total garbage in politics and we're through. We are done with it. And the reason why we had some very surprising political candidates go the distance this year is because they appeared to actually believe what they were saying while they were talking. <laughs> and that's how high the bar is these days, folks, to really set yourself apart from the field. You just have to communicate like a reasonable, decent, normal person and you're like the best politician anyone's ever laid eyes on. <laughs> but this is what the new generation is going to insist on. And I think it's wonderful because it obsoletes the obviously manipulative crop of politics. The Ted Cruz's of the world become obsolete. These transparently manipulative <laughs> politicians, no one's going to give them the time of day anymore. And that's how we make progress, by a whole generation just slowly turning its back on a whole crop of politicians. Other ones will spring up to, to meet that demand, to be authentic, to be real with you. And it is only a matter of time. I can't wait for the cavalry to ride in on that one. Awesome. We are now, this is our last question before the lightning round. So here we go. <clears throat> What's your process for listening to consumers and constituents and finding out what they really want? And we'll start with Senator Jackson. Um, I've had a lot of interesting conversations in the last two and a half years, and I've developed this rule. It's an internal rule just for me that works for me. And my rule is anyone who's talking to me has something of value to say, no matter what they're saying to me, no matter how it may seem at first blush, I am determined to find the kernel 
of value or truth, even if the perspective is diametrically opposed to mine. I was at a panel about two, three months ago, and we were talking about gay marriage. And afterwards, this nice-looking woman came up to me, and she shook my hand. She said, you are such an articulate young man. It is too bad you are going straight to hell. <laughs> And I shook her hand, and I said, thank you for sharing your perspective. <laughs> and I'm still working on finding the kernel of truth in that statement. Cassie Parsons. I have the privilege uh, to get in my dining room all the time. My, my room is very small, so I can cook for a little bit. Chef Vanessa will let me come offline and go hang, hang with uh, everyone and hug them. And a lot of our conversations that we have is politics, um, religion, food. We have lots of conversations that happen. But the things that I hear the most about, because I'm in the food industry and this is what I love, is, you know, my daughter has diabetes, or, you know, uh, my grandmother's got cancer, or there's such a high rate of cancer rate, or, you know, what is the food system doing? Why is everybody dying? Why is everybody sick? And it really makes you start thinking, especially as a chef and a sausage maker, because I know what's going in it, and I'm seeing it and watching everything happening. In the last 13 years, I have seen and experienced and have been to so many funerals, seen people die from cancer, diabetes, all of these things, and it makes me pause. And by pausing, it's not that I just get to sit still. By pausing is like, what can I do? What can I, and how can I make a difference? And if standing up behind a podium and telling you the truth or maybe um, making you upset to hear some of the things that maybe you should be start thinking about. Maybe that's what I'm supposed to be. I'm the messenger. I'm the messenger about real food from real farms. Um, 13 years ago, when we started, when I started farming, I was selling our product at the farmer's market here in Charlotte, Matthews, et cetera. And we'd have people come up to the table and tell us how grateful they were that we were actually growing food, that they had a place that they could come that is authentic, that's real, that they could come to our farm and see what we're doing, and that they could feed their families really good food, clean food, fair food. Because see, on our farm, it is fair. We don't have antibiotics and hormones floating around. We're not held captive by the big box, um, Smithfields and Cargyles and all these Monsantos and all this big ag corruption. We're not held by that. So when the conversations come into us, we get to do it more on a grassroots. We get to do it with the people because we are the people. Go ahead. Good, awesome. Yes. Stop? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so here we go, lightning round, here we go. What is your secret ingredient? Love. Three words, Cassie. Or less. Dog. <laughs> I apologize. Pay attention. Um, <laughs> I can take it. <laughs> Half their age. Ooh. What is the nastiest part of what you do? Three words or less. Uh, Monsanto's. Smithfield, sorry, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say that, and Cargyle. <laughs> the comments section. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your mentor in the kitchen? Lucy Jacobs. Senator Josh Stein, who is running for Attorney General, and I recommend him. Hey oh. We're going to let those extra words slip Lucy through. Lucy Jacobs fine. was one of the best Italian chefs I've ever known and will ever know. Just saying. Candidates, candidates, please. <laughs> get, a, get control of yourselves. <laughs> and another thing. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you wish people knew about making sausages? It is fun. Laws. Mainly good people. Hmm? Okay. Bad structure. Good people. <laughs> And finally, fill in the blank. 
Blank will happen when pigs fly. Donald Trump. <laughs> that was my answer. That was my answer. Okay, that's it. That's it. <laughs> what an amazing note, but I do want to give you each a closing statement of one minute each, and we'll start with Cassie Parsons. You have a choice. We get choices, and we can either uh, make good choices or another choice. And the choice though, that I like to make about food is feeding you real food from real farms, and I do that every day. Not just once. Senator Jackson. Well, just thank you to my opponent. Um, I prepared all week for this debate. I cleared my entire schedule. We built a mock stage. I hired someone to play Cassie. Uh, didn't want to be accused of being underprepared for such an important moment. Um, and let me just say to those of you, maybe there's someone here who's a little pessimistic about North Carolina's state politics. Let me just, as a word of encouragement, it is going to be okay. We are going to get through this. And years from now, not that many years from now, we're going to look back and talk about this crazy four or five year period that existed in North Carolina politics. Please do not let this turn you off from the idea of self-government. We need you to be involved. We certainly need you to vote. If y'all don't vote this election, I don't know what to tell you. Please, go see Larkin if you're not registered. Thank you all for coming. See you soon. Senator Jeff Jackson and Cassie Parsons, everybody. How about that? Yeah. Thank you.